The Labour Party has described comments credited to the Deputy Speaker of the House of Representatives, Benjamin Kalu, as childish and immature. The Deputy Speaker, Kalu, had at the weekend in a viral interview vowed that Governor Alex Oti will be the last Labour Party governor in Abia State. This has since elicited comments and reactions from the citizens. Chinwe Ugele interviewed the National Vice Chairman, South East and the State Chairman of the party with some residents. Makes anyone to relax. He should look at his position uh, and then the weight of that what you ask him to take me. Those comments of the Deputy Speaker House of Representatives, yeah, Ben yeah, Carlo, yeah. did stir up concerns over the weekend among citizens and party faithful alike. Uh, you know, everybody has a, a liberty of opinion. The leadership of the Labour Party in the zone says the party remains a strong force to contend with in 2027. The Labour Party cannot, will not, and will never be threatened by the statement accredited to Ben Carlo. Of course, Ben uh, spoke as a small god. He arrogated power he does not have to himself. We know very frankly that their strategy of grabbing it, snatching it, and running away will not work in Abia. The state chairman of Labour Party, Emmanuel Oti, insists the governor will remain in the party. Because I know him too. Even if I'm sleeping, even if I'm sleeping, I've analyzed him. I've analyzed his character, political character. The deputy speaker had in the same video claimed that Governor Alex Oti was taking credit for the president's effort. But C.K. Igara challenges him to name the efforts usurped by the governor. I also challenge him to let us know that all the works being done by Dr. Alex Oti, whether it is Tinubu that is doing it. The citizens believe it is up to the electorate to decide through the polls who becomes the governor of Abia State come 2027. It, it, it cannot determine uh, the tenure of this uh, of the uh, governor Oti. It can't determine that. It is the electorate that will decide and call what happens in 2027. There is also the individual assessment of Governor Alex Ote's performance in office. Uh, the governor has done a lot. In fact, he's still serving grace at this particular hour. But looking at what the man has done so far in this place, uh, I think he deserves a second test. But then, it is now in the governor's court to decide whether to jump into another political party or remain in the party that brought him to power. In Omar Hafani Central, Chinwe Ugele. Thanks to Chinwe Ugele for that uh, very interesting report. And of course, you know, the uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, Benjamin Kalu, and his uh, thought concerning 2027. You know, I did see, of course, you know, people also respond to it. It, it is within his right, you know, of course, to um, push for his push party. For, you know, absolutely. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, many people may not necessarily find it welcoming mostly because there's been a you know seeming a lot of you know praise for governor alex oti you know and of course you know he got in with the labor party ticket um, um, um right after um, um okay Zipa Azu, you know had been there for eight years under the pdp um the the analysis on okazia's run or okazia's time in office have not been very very positive At all. a lot of people of course you know say that he failed the state woefully for those eight years and so um, Alex Oti, you know, has his four years. We'll see how things turn out in 2027. Benjamin Carlo, of course, is within his rights. Um, it's the people that will decide. You know, I mean, I, I think that at the end else. of the day, this will be a huge uh, reflection of how we view politics and political influences in our elections. And I say this because oftentimes we've said on the show here that if you do a good job as a mm -hmm. political candidate, the need to campaign would reduce because people can see. And when it's time for the elections, people will come out en masse to vote for you. For example, I'd always say that the administration that will solve Nigeria's energy problems will be an administration that will not need to beg people to vote for them because Nigerians can see the work that they have done and will come out en masse to vote for them. Alex Oti has gotten lots and lots of praises from the people with the development he brought, he's brought to the state. So I guess the polls will reveal what really you know, is at play, if it's politics yeah. or if it's really people's... Uh, votes that you know that have come to play 
part of the criticism that have been leveled against Benjamin Kalu are from the Igbos who feel that uh, he's being he's betraying the Igbo people by what he's saying. He has referred to himself as the number six man in the state, and you know, having been the number six man, he understands how this goes. And of course, like you've said, exercising his right to support his political party. But one of the criticisms that I saw leveled against him was that if you, as an Igbo man, are the number six person, if there are six geopolitical zones and you are at the bottom of that, you know, lineup, it should tell you because the Igbo people have been campaigning for the opportunity to lead the country and have not yet gotten that opportunity. So it tells you where you are and, you know, some have called him a sellout. No, but, been... So again, you know, within his right, you know, and of course, you know, people will make bold political statements um, in the build-up to any election. You know, the 2027, you know, is still, you know, a while away, but, you know, that is fine. Um, but of course, you know, I don't think it will be easy to let, for the Ab Abia people to forget what the PDP's run in Abia state Gave them. Even though they are arguing that uh, the <laughs> anyway, part of the argument is that the Igbo people had a better fighting chance when the PDP was in office. But then again, like Otagia said, bold political claims will be made. Absolutely. A lot of statements will be made. But the countdown to 2027 is on, and we hope that at the end of the day, the voice of the people will be the voice of God. Absolutely, of course. You remember Oju Zakalo and uh, Okeze Pazu. There's not a lot, you know, that we can point to that they achieved. But anyway. President Bola Ahmed Tinubu has traveled to France in his new Airbus A330 aircraft, a safer replacement to the 19-year-old Boeing 737 previously used for presidential travel. The president's France trip has been made possible by Zonshan Funcheng Industrial Investment Limited's goodwill gesture to release one of the Nigeria's, uh, pres Nigerian president's seized aircraft. The Chinese firm had obtained a court order to seize the jets belonging to the Nigerian government after the Ogun state government allegedly failed to meet its obligations in a 2016 business deal. While the firm agreed to release one plane, it is holding on to the other two as well as other Nigerian properties secured through a British court order pending resolution of the matter. This development comes as the presidency faces criticism for purchasing a new presidential jet amidst the economic challenges. Joining us is Assistant Secretary General Aviation Safety Round Table Initiative Olumide Owayo, who joins us shortly. Uh, but it's very interesting to see that, you know, this conversation is one that has been on for the longest time. Before we even get to the presidential jet, the Zhongshan Fucheng Industrial Investment Limited, uh, which is the Chinese company, the argument as to their involvement in all of this and Ogun State, it, it is said, you know, some of the perspectives that we've seen about it would be that is a state allowed to go into international, get, you know, international deals like that without the approval of the federal government? Uh, one of the things that Patutomi said was that he did go to president, he wasn't president then, Bola Ahmed Tinubu at the time, when he was the APC political leader, to say that this is a challenge that we're going through, this is what is happening, they're not allowing me to execute this, you know, but uh, there was nothing he did about it. And the only reason I mentioned Patu Tommy is because Patu Tommy only spoke about his experience when this came to light. But this, many have said it's, a, it's an embarrassment, even though it's not an embarrassment that was caused because of President Bola Tinubu's administration, because the contract predated him. It was from the time of, uh, you know, way before him, from the Buhari era, if I recall. But it's basically looking at, uh, at the role that the, the, the state government has to play in all of this. Should the federal government then have to bear the brunt of this. And unfortunately, what message are we sending to international investors that Nigeria is not a safe place? Is that what we're sending to them, that we can bail out of contracts and you know, nothing will be done about it? The fact that they had to seize a national president, a, a national aircraft, to be able to send across a message. It's very embarrassing. Not just that, seized about two of Nigeria's properties in the UK. It's really, really an embarrassment. Absolutely. And I mean, it, it, it depends on how this case goes, right? If there is eventually now the need for a full repayment or um, um, a compensation to the Chinese firm, depends on how the courts, you know, eventually rule. That money of obviously will be gotten from Ogun State's, you know, allocations. Really? So that's, that's another mean, thing. I'm, I'm, Who's I'm, going to do the payment? Is it going to be Ogun State? Is it going to be the federal government? I know that he had a $70 million um, arbitration award that was given to um, the company from the Nigerian government. Yes. And nothing has been done about it. In fact, this, this was given years ago. And then, you know, now they're trying to do a stay, stay of that uh, arbitra arbitration award. They could have done something about this a long time ago. They didn't until it became a national embarrassment. So 
who exactly is going to do the payment? I mean, well, somebody has to pay, you know, um, except we have a complete reversal of the court ruling, you know, that, of course, you know, doesn't award them any damages, you know, $70 million or not. If there isn't anything like that, then somebody would have to pay. And, yeah. you know, this is as a result of some level of mismanagement by a gov uh, from a governor, I mean, and whether or not they pay the arbitration award, it's at the end of the day, what reputation has he said about Nigeria? But yeah. let's move the conversation away from the failed deal and the jet that has been released. Uh, we do have two still left with them. We're joined this morning by the Assistant Secretary General, Aviation Safety Roundtable Initiative, Olumide Owayo. Good morning, Mr. Owayo. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So let's get your thoughts on, you know, how this plays out on the international scene. Presidential jet, one, one, you know, three were seized from what we hear. One has been released. There are two still held back. What message are we sending across to the international community? Let me start from where you stopped. And I think uh, I need to commend your team there. That's about, uh, about the first uh, um, time I'm hearing since this saga started, who's going to pay for this? And um, I'm happy you ended it before coming to me. And I think Governor... The book Muslim should be with the DSS right now, rather than jumping on the internet and uh, responding to uh, uh, to uh, Professor Tommy and others. Um, coming to your coming to your question, um, I think uh, once again we have thrown ourselves into the into the international fora as another as another country that does not stick to agreements. And when when you don't stick to agreement, you tend to drive investors away. Embarrass, embarrass yourself. No matter, no matter what efforts you put in on the domestic front, you must your, your agreements must be sacrosanct. That's been a major problem in the aviation industry, and I think um, uh, this again has also woken us up to see that we, we need to have our agreements to be sacrosanct and empower an independent judiciary. Because the Chinese man refused to come to any court in Nigeria because he was not sure of getting a fair judgment. And even if he gets a judgment, the implementation might be difficult, might take years. That's why you have to run out of the country. And in running out now, we have been badly embarrassed. And I think this is another lesson for us to tidy up our sense of agreement, that agreements within, between government agencies and government, and any arm of government, with any board, whether domestic or international, you do not toy with it. From, the, from conception to implementation, that to the signing and implementation, you must ensure you pay for a good lawyer to look at it, to ensure that every line corresponds and becomes favorable so you don't, don't get your fingers burnt. That's what we are finding ourselves today. And now we are, we are looking for arbiters now who have also refused. Uh, all the arbiters, if I've seen them on the reports, all the arbiters have asked, uh, have said Obustet was guilty, and they need to pay. And that's the situation we are finding ourselves. They are going after properties in London, they are going after money, um, uh, monies in England, and also now they don't want aircrafts in Paris. Um, you know, from this issue. There's a lot of points that must be made um, and we should not ignore when we have, you know, these conversations. So we'll probably come back to it if we have time. But, you know, I want us to talk now about the presidential jet in, in particular. It was one of the things yeah. that made the story even bigger, you know, with the fact that the presidency then eventually had to own up that they had actually purchased, you know, this new jet. So, you know, I want your thoughts on how necessary it was to purchase this new presidential jet for Mr. President which, of course, you know, is currently in France with him um, on their work stay. Um, do, do you agree that it was entirely important? The previous jets were just not, you know, fixable or workable. And it was, you know, I mean, we had no other choice but to spend however mm -hmm. amount, you know, of, of money we spent in buying this one. Let, let me make a correction there. That the, the president only accepted that they had a new, uh, they got, got, got a new aircraft when this aircraft was seized. Before then, yeah. it was... It was it was back and forth. There was no confirmation. Now, again, the, um, the, the French government are released the Airbus, uh, the, the French made aircraft. And the other two American made aircraft, the, uh, the BBG and the Bombardier, are the ones that they left for the Chinese to hold on to. We never knew uh, those three aircrafts were there. Those two, well, two, the other two are meant to be sold. While the, the Airbus uh, is the one that was bought and uh, Brought to, uh, brought to the release for the president to call use France and the aircraft president in France to be president of France yesterday. But you see, uh, go, go into your question. Is that a problem that is befitted, that is a uh, sickness at the moment? Do we actually need a presidential jet now? We have so many financial and economic problems that 
uh, that is besetting the nation that also led to some protests. And I thought that the government, when we begin to ask Nigeria to cut their coat, to put it their size, if they ask us to tighten our belt, they should start from the presidency. We must see that in you. The timing of this aircraft, the type of aircraft, is not beneficial to Nigeria. The aircraft that we are talking about is going to be 15 years old next month. This aircraft is just going to be 15 years old next month. And the one they are sold is 19 years old. So if, are you saying that in the next four years, you are going to sell this aircraft that you have bought? If you are selling a 19 year old aircraft, and a 19 year old aircraft in the presidential fleet, if you look, if you look at the number of runs and operations at the, at the rotations it has, it is about a, a five-year-old aircraft, or even a four-year-old aircraft in the commercial fleet. Well, the commercial fleet flies every day, every, almost every two, three hours. The presidential, flight, the presidential aircraft goes, goes flying on flights maybe once or twice a month. So what was wrong if if, if, if if the maintenance, the air fleet, the presidential air fleet team cannot manage a 19-year-old business jet that was bought by the president of Boston John when, 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 when he was in office? Cannot, how, how would they manage a more expensive, a bigger A330? If it be just so expensive, how are you going to manage it? This one will be more, this one, which is bigger and is more expensive to maintain? So, so essentially, I, 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 see, I see the next government coming in, selling the aircraft immediately. And, but the problem is, they're going to sell at a loss, but I don't see anybody coming to pick that aircraft, apart from me, any of the um, uh, rich Arab guys. What about you want a big A330? Do you want to hold a party on board? It's not for the president and his team? Right. I even hold it in my IMF conference the aircraft. I, just I, mean, just, I wonder why that, 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 that kind of choice. Just and to further buttress that. Uh, bought an A340, brand new. The biggest aircraft on, on, in Airbus fleet at a dead. And today that aircraft is flying far on the time out there, in a dead, dead area. When, what, what, what we have commonly called graveyard of aircraft. That's what the aircraft is, a brand new aircraft. Nobody's going to buy it. Nobody's going to buy it. Sorry, who do you say brought a brand new A340? Arik, Arik, eh? Just before they collapse, and that and that aircraft led to their led, led to their problems. That aircraft is lying down at the airport today. Nobody's buying it, and they will have to put out that aircraft. An aircraft is less than ten years old, and now you have gone there to pick an A330, a big aircraft, for Mr. President and who? It's for that of assembly to have, to have meetings on board. On board, and the aircraft is too big. It's more confirmed. It's more expensive than the big that they're selling. So I don't know how did they come about that decision, and who and had the conversation of selling the BBJ? Oh, how did they come about the decision that the aircraft was no more serviceable? That it was a safety risk. Who gave that report? Okay, I mean just to the address what you have the said. The BBJ will not manage the Airbus three thirty, and you can be sure that you have not been told the expense the expense that is coming to the government because you will not have to train all the crew of uh, the crew of conversion. You have to train the engineer. You have to train the cabin crew. All right. I, I would like to further address, you know, what you had said about wondering why they couldn't maintain a 19-year-old jet. The checks by Daily Trust indicate that the Boeing 747, the Air Force One used by the U.S. president, the most powerful president in the world, is 34 years old and it has served no fewer than six presidents, including the incumbent, Joe, uh, Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. so, but, but just to then talk about the new jet that has been purchased. Reports have it that it's not a new jet, it's a jet that is about 15 years old uh what do you make of yes, that you have confirmed the information as to the age of the new jet and you know what does that then mean well i just said that now i said if you are selling an egg you're selling the one you have that is 19 year old and you're buying the one that's 15 year old so invariably in four years time as you're leaving office you're going to sell it again if you cannot maintain a smaller, is a smaller aircraft, the BBD, which is smaller than the A330. If you cannot maintain, if the process of procedure in place in present air fleet cannot maintain and keep that uh, uh, BBG that is acclaimed to be a very excellent and uh, uh, performing aircraft, how would you not keep a, uh, an A330 that is much bigger than the BBG? And how did you come about the, 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 the advice to move from the, the, the smaller BBJ to a bigger A330 that's more expensive to maintain in these days of a um, high fuel cost, in this of lack of power for forex? How did you come about putting uh, such money in, uh, in that aircraft? I don't want to go into the figures that was used, but I cannot prove it. Okay. Uh, I, 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 I
But that aircraft, a brand new one, is about $213 uh, 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 billion. Dollars. Yeah. I mean, so I don't know how much they're going to feel. Yeah, very, very, you know, important questions. You know, we did have a conversation yesterday with um, um, someone, and of course, you know, his views are that, you know, Nigerians should not play with the uh, safety and security of our president. And so whatever it takes to ensure that we have a functional and, of course, you know, a, a jet that, or a presidential jet, rather, that is, you know, 100% um, uh, safe for flying, you know, we must pay. It doesn't matter what it would cost the country. So do you agree with that? And, you know, what also do you think is the fate of the other two jets, you know, seeing the legal proceedings that may occur going forward? Well, um, if those aircraft were not of value, the, the Chinese uh, company wouldn't have gone for an injunction seizing them. And uh, those aircraft, if they're not flyable, you would not have put them for sale. You'd have just butchered them, you know, and asked someone to buy that aircraft right here in Nigeria without taking out of the country. Now, for each now list for, for those aircraft to be listed uh, in, in, in the US for uh, being available being, being available for purchase shows that those aircraft are still flyable. What I see here is ego. But this is ego. And like you, and you, you said, you said well, well, do you need, do we really need a presidential fleet? Do we need those number of aircraft? The British Prime Minister does not have any aircraft in his fleet. Doesn't have any aircraft in his fleet. He says, fine. Flying fly a, 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 a BA or a total aircraft. Do we need all those aircraft? You go and make me to, to borrow you money and you are going flying down with, with a big aircraft and those are borrowing those aircraft? And he says, I'm just going to give you, give you those funds at, at a good, uh, on the, on the, on the, on the good time and condition. Come on, we, 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 our parties are not right, sincerely, with respect to this aircraft. Our parties are not right. And when was this approved? When was this aircraft uh, uh, approved? When was the money approved? Did it pass through the Senate? We never heard of anything. Well, the only thing we heard was when they took those documents to the, to the Senate committee, uh, and they told us that the, the aircraft in, in the field of the presidency are not are, 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 are risk into the president's life and other things. Who gave them that report? Who assessed those aircraft? And aircraft is a risk to the level of the president is not put on sale in the US. So is the US is the so the new owner wants to die? I mean, I, I, would you would you even and say that that? Yeah, would you argue? Yeah, can you hold on? Would you argue that even the uh, lack of clarity with the purchasing, you know, of this new aircraft, how much money it was really, you know, uh, uh, bought for, um, and of course, if there was a bidding process, if anybody also got kickbacks from, you know, the process, what, you know, part of Nigeria's budget was expended in buying it, are these things? Um, enough questions that maybe, you know, in a sane society would be impeachable offenses for mismanaging Nigeria's funds? Well, you have said, you have said it all. You have said it all. I, I think I, I, you have said it all. Uh, because we, we never saw the process, we never saw the bidding, we never, it was never presented at the, at, at, at the, at the Senate or the House of Rep uh, for, 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 the, for them to approve such expense. And now today we are saying it belongs to the federal government. So what, we get it, who, who approved it? When was it presented? The last, the only time we ever heard anything about it was when they, when they, when they discredited the, 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 the aircraft in the field of the presidency. And when you discredit such aircraft in the field, when you say none of the aircraft is flyable, then there, there's, an, there's an indictment on the presidential fleet maintenance and crew. And, that, and, and I think that an audit should have started with that, rather than go straight to buy a, a new, a, a, another brand of aircraft that requires total training and overhauling of, 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 of the of, of the equipment uh, storage and training of the, of the crew and engineers and all our team handling uh, the presidential air fleet. And uh, those, those and, and you, know, you, know, you cannot just go buy those aircraft those have, without having all those training in place. Invariably, this this is premeditated and, and the president has started even before they came to the house to tell us that the, uh, the president's life is in danger. And how was the president's life in danger? How was the president's life in danger? All right. Um, we have to wait and see exactly how this will turn out. We have two jets that are still yet to be released. And one wonders about what the fate will be if we do have to pay the uh, um, arbitration award to the tune of $70 million. Well, that will do to a country that is grappling with making ends meet in this day and age. And uh, we, we are glad that you joined us. Thank you very much, Mr. Wanyo, for joining us. And we hope that we can have some positive news regarding this uh, in the nearest future, even though I'm not, I'm not as hopeful. <laughs> but let's see how it goes.
Thank you for having me. Thank you very much for joining us. And just before we um, move on, I think we should also just quickly uh, apologize to our viewers on YouTube. I, I think we, we might be having slight issues over there, but please, um, they will be sorted out. And, of course, you would get the um, show on. Um, the show continues, but you can always continue us on, uh, on our YouTube page. We, of course, will take a short break. When we come back, we're moving into more conversations this morning in Edo State in particular. Stay with us. The Court of Appeal in Abuja has confirmed Philip Shaibu as the Deputy Governor of Edo State, rejecting the appeal filed by the Edo State House of Assembly, which sought to uphold his impeachment. Although the exact date of the ruling was not disclosed, the Court of Appeal's decision aligns with the previous judgment by the Federal High Court in Abuja. The lower court had dismissed the Assembly's impeachment of Mr. Shaibu, which took place on April 8. The Assembly had accused Mr. Shaibu of leaking government secrets, a charge he claimed was fabricated due to his governorship aspirations. Following his removal, the Assembly confirmed Omobaya Godwin as his replacement, nominated by Governor Godwin Obaseke. Now, on the 17th of July, the Federal High Court overturned Mr. Shaibu's removal and reinstated him, ordering that his entitlement since April be paid and instructing the Inspector General of Police to restore his security de uh, detail. Despite the ongoing legal proceedings, Mr. Shaibu resumed his duties as Deputy Governor, leading the state government to accuse him of impersonating Mr. Godwin's. In response, Mr. Shaibu called the allegation an affront on the judiciary and emphasized that Mr. Godwin's was an appointee of, Godwin, of, of, of Governor Godwin Obasaki, not an elected official. Now, joining us is uh, the President, African Public Interest Lawyers Union, Andrew Enwata. Good morning. Uh, thanks for joining us. Saruge, good morning, Oli. It's a pleasure to be on the program this morning. Good to have you. Let's, I mean, get your thoughts on the recent uh, updates with regard to uh, um, Deputy Governor Philip Shaibu. Um, it, as, of, as of last week, it seemed like there was going to be some back and forth. But, you know, as of now, it seems like he has been fully reinstated. What are your thoughts? Yeah, thank you. Um, I was in court yesterday. You know, the funny part of this whole thing is that before now, we used to hear stories that, oh, the court gave me judgment, but they have gone to obtain an order of stay of execution. But I was surprised that yesterday, none of them, I mean, their lawyers, they had over five senior advocates, none of them raised this issue of stay of execution before the Court of Appeal. Because I know as a matter of law, I teach law, when you apply to the lower courts, and if that application is not granted because you have an appeal, you make that same application before the Court of Appeal. That didn't play out yesterday. So it means that all those stories we heard from the district government are all lies. But yesterday, the Court of Appeal in Appeal Number 645 dismissed the appeal filed by the Industrial House of Assembly you know, um, in respect of the impeachment proceedings. And I think it's good we situate this. When the impeachment process started, the deputy governor was not issued with the allegations against him. And of course, the governor quickly went ahead to set up you know, a panel of persons who were either his previous or past appointees and associates of the PDP. So we went to court. We filed suit 405. And the court actually gave an interlocutory order, you know, telling the House of Assembly and those involved to come and show cause why they should proceed. But in spite of that court order, the day the court was to you know, review its order, that was the day they actually effected the impeachment. But luckily for us, we were already in court. So I think it was because they didn't want this case to proceed. We then barely filed that case. And in the official name of the deputy governor, we didn't file that case as Philip Schreiber against the House of Assembly. We filed that case as deputy governor by Dustin because we knew that they were going to break the bill. But uh, after we uh, realized that they had made up their mind that to go against those court or the court order that was granted, we had to now bring up another case, which is 478. So I'm trying to now make you understand that the decision given yesterday was in respect of 405 that was initially filed before the impeachment as against 478, for which the court eventually gave that judgment. And because we leave two of 478 is exactly what we're asking for 405, the judgment of Justice Tomato Shot covers the field. Why the decision of yesterday is unique is that a mobile of Godwin's, who was appointed by Obaseki, was claiming to be the deputy governor in this present appeal. And that is why the House of Assembly now brought up this you know, appeal against an earlier ruling, where we now wanted to change the status of the case from deputy governor to Shaibu. They quickly ran, rushed to the court of appeal, challenging the, the jurisdiction of the court. 
And we're happy that um, yesterday the Court of Appeal graciously dismissed that appeal because the appeal was without merit. And that, in a way, has reaffirmed the decision earlier given by Justice Ramatashaw, saying that the Office of Deputy Governor of Edo State was not vacant, is not vacant, and will not be vacant until 12 November 2024, when the joint tickets of Obaseke and Shaibu would have expired by a fusion of time. And I think it's a victory for democracy, victory for lovers of what is right, victory for the rule of law. And it remains one fact that Edo State has a joint ticket of Obaseke and Shaibu. It does not matter whether the governor likes the deputy governor or not. It is what the Court of Appeal has affirmed, the judgment of Justice Omotosha, stating right. clearly that Philip Shaibu remains a deputy governor of Edo State. So what does that mean for Edo State in the next less than three months? We know that the elections will be coming up on the 12th of November, which is less than three months from today. Seeing that we have a, pre a governor and a deputy governor that obviously do not like each other and most likely may not work. What does this mean, may not work together? What does this mean for the people of Edo State? Also, looking at the fact that Philip Shaibu is no longer a part of the party. Yeah, thank you. I think I'll start with the last. The law does not say that as a deputy governor, if you decide to cross carpet, you lose your seat as deputy governor. We've seen that in many instances. In Ondo recently, the person who is a candidate of the PDP, Agola, was not on the same ship with his boss, you know, Mimiko. There was a time he even joined another party to run for. I mean, the, sorry, not uh, Mimiko, the uh, governor that died, uh, Akele Dulu, SAN. So you find that as a deputy governor, unlike a legislator who loses his state, you can decide to join another party. And remember that the deputy governor did not just leave PDP, he was forced out of the party. You saw the way the governor treated him. The governor treated him as an outcast. The national leadership of PDP failed to intervene. They were taking sides. So, you know, in, you know, it was in that stormy guild, the people of APC reached out to him. And he acceded to their request. And, you know, he's now a blessing to the party. This is the first time in our state history where we have a PDP governor and an APC deputy governor, which the Court of Appeal has affirmed yesterday. So the beauty of it is that Obasaki's dictatorship has been cut into two. Initially, he appointed somebody as deputy governor. The law does not allow him, when you have a sitting deputy governor, to appoint because he was in a hurry to get votes from Akoko Edo, where his impost comes from. You know, the man just keeps breaking the law. And I'm happy that because the Court of Appeal has given this decision, it makes it very clear that two of them will remain in office in November because, by the grace of God, on September 21st, Edo people will come allowed to choose a new governor. And the implication of that is that it's a clear countdown to the end of Obaseki's uh, eight-year reign, which for us, it is for historians to now assess him across sectors. Because it's very unfortunate that the governor whose tenure is about to end, the man is busy fighting everything that can be fought. Unfortunately, your own deputy governor, and I must quickly say that in the history of politics, we've hardly seen in our state a situation where a governor will kick out his deputy. And what the governor fails to realize is in the politics of the state, your deputy governor is like your mate, is like your wife, is your political wife, not the first lady. The first lady has no place in our constitution. That office is unconstitutional. So this is a man you would have brought very close together. People can pilot the affairs of the state. You saw how the deputy governor went on more than one TV station to explain what he has gone through on our Paseki and explain that the man is a very lawless person, that in spite of court, he does not even obey court orders. So I'm happy that the Court of Appeal, which is a superior court, has put pay to those lies that I'm they are filing an application for If I may interject at this point, uh, Mr. Wanta, wh when you're saying the man is a lawless person, we're talking about Governor Godwin Obaseki, right? I quoted his deputy governor. All right, great. He I, I just wanted Obaseki to highlight certain things. Person. And when he says he's a lawless person, is he referring to just this particular case or predating this no this before world. now before now and i'll tell you why i think he's a lawless person but i serve in his government obaseki does not obey law i mean decisions of court he does not be, obey orders of court there was a particular supporter of his in the apc tony kabaka there was a court order for the man's house not to be demolished in spite of that court order obaseki went ahead to demolish his house and eventually when the court gave its judgment the court has given Edo State a very huge you know, bill. The damages done will be paid by the taxpayers. Whether we like it or not, it's a judgment of court. And unfortunately, too, you discover that uh, the National Judicial Council, which is the highest you know, decision-making body for the judiciary, last year 
We commended eight judges for appointment. We got a court order asking the governor to come and show cause. The governor disobeyed that order. Instead of swearing in the eight of them, he swore, only, he swore in only five. As we speak, three of these judicial officers are in limbo. This is a man, he has no respect for court orders. He has no respect for the judiciary. He has no respect even for his own deputy governor. He has All no right. respect for I the just wanted... constitution and no respect for those people who elected both of them on the joint ticket. So why, why, why I was asking you that question, and you've highlighted it, is because I wanted to say what your response would be to those who say that Godwin Obaseki has worked with Philip Shaibu. They came together on the joint ticket. And Philip Shaibu has also been, you know, for years prior to this uh, falling out, supported and thrown his weight behind Godwin Obaseki. So is he only speaking up now? Did he not see maybe a flaw in character? And does this not in a way also affect the reputation of Philip Shaibu? Uh, hold that thought. We'll go on a break. And when we come back, we'll have you answer that question. Welcome back to Breakfast Central. We're still looking at uh, the drama going on in Edo State and the reinstatement of Philip Shai was the deputy governor of the state. We're joined by Honorable Andrea Mwata. Thank you once again for joining us. Now, before we went on the break, I'd asked you a question as to what your thoughts are and your reactions to those who say that Philip Shai cannot come now and cry foul about uh, Godwin Obaseki being a lawless person because for years, not only has he worked with him, but he has thrown his support behind him. So what will your reaction to that be? I can tell you for free that sometime last year, March precisely, the deputy governor queried funds that accrued from local government IGRO. He was the one that raised that alarm March last year, and I think that is one of the reasons why the governor became angry with him. That in a, in, a, in an entire month, the 18 local governments raised a partial sum of 30 million. Before that time, allocations to, I mean, local governments and the IGRO was being shared by Obaseke and his rooms. And for the deputy governor to have raised that alarm, that must have made the governor to see him as exposing the quote unquote secrets of government. I said it severally, and I'll say it again, that the last ESCO meeting we had on the 4th of May last year, the deputy governor confronted the immediate past secretary to state government that all the funds that accrue from the 30% of your derivation funds were being concentrated in one local government in Bobaoka, where the SSU comes from, and complained that most of the contractors working in the state, they were all doing the projects at the behest of the second to the state government. And of course, the governor was a beneficiary of that uh, you know, enterprise. So having raised that, they also saw that the deputy governor was raising certain issues that ought to have been kept secret. So, I mean, if a man serving in the government haven't taken so much, haven't seen so much of abuse, do you know in the past one year, the Edo State Oil and Gas Commission is being run by one man, the immediate past secretary to the Edo State Governor, Sarodionke. And resources from that place that was meant for development was concentrated in the local government he comes from. The governor's contractors were the ones doing projects in this area. So, I mean, these were instances in government where the deputy governor protested. And because before that time, he was doing 100% loyalty, and he noticed that that loyalty was now, you know, mistaken for cowardice, he started speaking up. And of course, when he now wanted to run, that was where the governor's grievance started from. That, okay, he's a loyal man. Okay, somebody that has, you know, managed the oil and gas commission for me. But you, you keep complaining. You were the one that exposed the, the fraud. How would 18 local government raise 30 million naira? What is 30 million naira? Oredo oh. alone, the resources from Oredo is such that Oredo should not make less than 50 million. The local government should not make less than 50 million. And it will surprise you to note that it is the governor's younger brother that is the chairman of that local government, Oredo local government. So what we are seeing in Edo State is a case of people now, I mean, the skills in the governor's, or rather the deputy governor's hand, fell. And it was when those skills fell, he now said, Obaseki, you must account to Edo people. Yeah. And that oh, is the I source want of the governor's you know, hatred for the deputy governor and his decision to, according to what the governor told the deputy governor, the deputy governor has said this in several in the media and elsewhere, that the governor said, I will destroy you if you run for the office of governor. All right. But Mr. we thank God for the current appeal that has restored him fully as deputy governor of Edo State. All right, Mr. Iwata, um, I, I also wanted you to speak as quickly as possible on um, the elections that are coming up, we have three leading candidates, Aswe Godalo, um, uh, Mondi Okwebolo, and of course, Ulumide Akpata, 
Um, what are your thoughts? You know, what's the conversation like in Edo State? Yeah, thank you. Uh, as we speak, I had a candidate of Labour Party. I think he went to America. He's about to go to America. Also, Ebudalo in the past one week has, has been in America. And I think maybe that's a new frontier, you know, knowing fully well that his uh, candidacy is in question. Remember, you know, about a week or around like two or three weeks ago, the Court of Appeal, we saw the certified copy, which, of course, dismissed an appeal he filed concerning his... Uh, his um, uh, certificate, I mean, his um, voter's card for rookies. And again, yesterday, the Court of Appeal has reserved judgments in the second appeal that was filed in respect of that case. Before that time, the Federal High Court had said that the process leading to his emergence, I mean, the courts invalidated that process. They have four appeals for which judgment is being awaited. So, as I speak to you, the PDP campaign is in limbo. They have paused. It's APC that have been campaigning across the Tunis in the district. APC has conducted rallies. We are doing what to what campaign. Yesterday, the campaign train was in um, the local government of the PDP candidates who were in his village, Ewohim. And the campaign there was huge because the crowd um, that came out was will very the APC, much will the APC I mean, the candidates candidate. back here. That was where APC campaigned yesterday. Yeah, so I think go. APC is a party to beat. Labour Party poses a big threat because when you look at the statistics, in the last yes. election, I understand, Mr. Mr. Iwata. Mr. Iwata, kindly, kindly hold on. So I think that's, we, that, that is where we have kindly hold on. Can you hear me? As a bigger threat than PDP. All right. I would, I would like, you know, I'm not sure if we can hold you to it. If you have any um, relationship with the APC's candidate, if we can ask that he please come on television and share his thoughts with the Nigerian people on his plans for Edo State. Um, he's been accused of shying away from the media and, you know, wanting to speak with, with the press. So can we hold you to it? You know, and of course, you know, ask that you please help pull him uh, to our television uh, uh, screens. I can assure you of that because I wear two caps, much as I'm the president of the African Public Interest Lawyers Union. I'm also the, the deputy director of publicity of the APC campaign. That's yeah, but we'd like to hear from him directly. We would like to hear from him directly. I can tell you for free. That we are actually arranging a media party, and we have about four um, TV stations whose um, journalists will come to interview our candidate on a myriad of issues, including this five point agenda. We have New Central, we have Arise TV, we have channels, and we have AIT. And I can assure you that the date for that is in the process of being fixed. And I'll tell you why we've not really had debates. You know, the PDP, their, their ticket is in limbo. The court have said they don't have a candidate by virtue of the fact that they failed to organize proper primaries. And the issue of the voters' card uh, forgery, which yeah, well. is a very strong disqualifying so criteria. So when PDP lacks that, you know, yeah. clear ticket, so it's will, difficult will, to now talk to wrap the up debate here. because it will not be fair. If tomorrow the court eventually takes out PDP, yeah, Mr. Iwata, we need to wrap up here. The, the, as an exercise in futility. Yeah. That's why channels. One candidate, can you hold on? Can you uh, hold on? We need yeah, to wrap yeah, up. I apologize. We need to wrap up here. But, you know, one candidate cannot be d depending on another candidate before he appears on television and speaks with the people. That's not a good enough excuse. But thank you very much for no, joining no, us. No, I didn't we, say, I didn't say we'll, that. We'll I didn't say that. Again. What I'm saying is that because the PDP's we, candidate's ticket is in limbo, that is why most organizers of debates have not been able to fix that. All right. But right. I can yeah. assure well, we'll you that everyone's going to appear on your platform. Yeah, we're holding you to your promise, Mr. I want to have to report having this interview done, but we have to go now. As a candidate, you cannot be... Mr. Iwata, we have to go like now. Me. Thank you so much. But I assure you that there's a bigger party being arranged. We need to keep the conversations going. Remember, to our viewers this morning, we have a lot more coming your way in the second half of Breakfast Central. Welcome back. And now let's uh, take you through the newspapers and share with you the major stories making headlines across Nigeria this morning. We're joined by Jason Okwade, who, of course, uh, will be analyzing some of these stories with us. Good morning. Yeah, good morning, sir. Thanks good morning, Olive. Good Thanks morning to us. all our listeners. All right. Let's get into it. And, of course, you know, kick off uh, this uh, morning on the Punch newspapers, I believe. Yes, it says the NNPC reports 9.3 trillion naira petrol imports as queues linger. Petrol subsidy gulps 3.3 trillion naira. NNPC incurs 1.8 trillion naira energy security cost. Um, and also uh, speaks on uh, Port Harcourt. Worry depots receive PMS. Task force arrest black marketers. Um, also on the Punch uh, newspapers this morning, it says that Akume Edun lead local government autonomy implementation panel. 
Uh, domestic airlines ground 42 aircraft, and that's in forex shortage. Producers decline sale of 460,000 barrels per day crude to Dangote and others. That, you know, drama there uh, seems to, of course, be unending. Uh, we can also find this morning on the Punch News. For 2027, APC kicks as PDP backs call for Jonathan's return. Uh, one dies as Ogo hunters and her herders clash. And uh, I think uh, those are the major ones that we can find on the Punch newspapers this morning. Um, yeah. All right, let's go to the next paper this morning. The next uh, big paper is the Vanguard newspaper. On the front page of the Vanguard newspaper, police invitation to Ajairo. We won't be silent, says NLC. Direct workers to shut down economy if Ajairo is arrested as global workers groups, CSOs and others raise alarm over worsening rights abuses in Nigeria. Why Ajero turned down police invitation, according to Falana, they of course said it was too last minute and they asked for a later date. And they said they can only honor the invitation on the 29th of August. Right of way tussle, right of way tussle threatens Nigeria's telecom sector. Diaspora remittances rise 130% to $553 million in July CBN. Police again fail to arraign protesters, says activist Ade Yondru. Cost of governance will cut 10 billion naira from COP29 expenses, says presidency. Hopefully they won't have a long list that will come under fire this year. Three years on the throne, the hardest lesson I learned, according to the Olu of Wari. Uh, the, the, I think the final story, PFN to Tinubu, Nigerians are hungry. Hasting renewed hope agenda. That's all on the bag. Let's get into the big story. Police invitation to Ajayiro. We won't be silent, says NLC. But, but uh, yes, the Nigerian Tribune. On the front page of the Nigerian Tribune, NLC's 54 affiliate unions threaten mass action if, dash, dash, the ellipses. Of course, we know what that mass action is, if, or what the condition of the mass action is. It's the arrest of, the, of Joe Ajayiro, the arrest and detainment of Joe Ajayiro. CBN records all-time high remittance inflows of $553 million in July. 21-year-old undergraduate contracted to act as girlfriend killed by ritualists in Quarrow. Wow. Lucky Community's family gave Lagos government a 30-day ultimatum over land acquisition. Fubara denies plan to dump PDP. We came must go for PDP to survive, Clark tells Damagom in open letter. Five years after trial, AGF office has no record of ex-CGN or Morgan's CCT case file. Appeal court upholds judgment nullifying tribal's impeachment as Edo deputy governor. U.S. announces $27 million humanitarian aid for Nigeria. Akume, Edun, Kadozo, Fagbemi, six others to enforce Supreme Court judgment on local government autonomy. Ondo establishes Amotekun rangers to curb forest crime. Ododo appoints 1,102 aides. <laughs> Nigeria. Enugu government said to demolish property used for kidnapping. Let's start with the NLC conversation. Um, Amnesty International has accused the N NLC, oh sorry, accused the federal government of meddling with the affairs or trying to suppress the uh, Nigerian workers. What are your thoughts on the drama between the police and Nigeria? Yeah, the drama between police and Nigeria, to me, it's uh, crystal clear in the sense that there was a report from the police that there is a particular tenant to, N uh, to NLC, uh, which uh, they are born on the second floor, and they have intelligent information about some of his activities that led to uh, a quarter, let me use the word of the PR to say coordinated uh, uh, visit to that second floor that they didn't come to uh, NLC themselves. Uh, but on picking some of the document from that particular area, uh, they have some questioning from the, for the NLC uh, president. You see, we are preempting a lot of things. Uh, we are the same set of people that will come at the police are not doing their job. They came to the second floor, but there is a gap which I am blaming the police from. We seem to be inviting the people that we consider as a, a, a party to this issue on ground, but we have not heard anything about the main culprit, the man who occupied the second floor either from NLC declaring his identity, or even the police themselves. Even yeah. if you're not going to give us stories surrounding it, you said that the man is a terrorist financer, uh, a threat to the country, a threat to Africa, a threat to the world at large. But who is this person? 
Up till now, we've not heard, but you are inviting someone in that particular, who is the landlord, coming to speak on behalf because the document you have shows certain transaction between them and the other. But we want a situation where the first person will actually be invited. Question. And let's see there is a link, even without that document. What if the, those documents are actually just uh, framed up somewhere and has no implication on the NLC? We want a situation where that person will be first invited. Question, and let's see the traces to the other party. And the issue of uh, NLC, you know, riding on this to say they want to shut down the economy if their president is actually arrested. I think it's an abuse of office, if you ask me, because... Uh, the same way they are communicating to the police that Mr. President of NLC will not be available is to say there are plans they have had before now because the info, in, invitation seems to be impromptu. Same of every businessman. The last time they shut down the system, a lot of businesses were actually down. People scheduled their meeting to travel out of the country, even within the country, domestic airline. They are unable to fulfill it, and it impacted greatly on some of the businesses that they had to carry for that particular time. Up till now, most airlines have not been able to refund even those that could not meet those trips for that specific day. So they should not abuse the privilege, you know, entrusted in their hands on the part of the citizen or the workers by saying that if their president is arrested, they will shut down the system. No, that's not the plight. Remember the end, uh, the end uh, bad governance protest. They were not involved because they felt that, well, that is not a route to go. So we want a situation that they will just stick with it, let the president show up himself, present, he has a legal counsel that will be there, and I'm sure he will not be there alone, rather than shutting down the old it's, system it's, for what is not. It's simply because we run, or seem, seem to run an abnormal system, where nobody trusts that the justice system will um, be... Uh, um, uh, free and fair. Yeah, we all know and, that. And the, the reason is, I apologize, we need to take a call, but the reason is, if, if we had a system where Joe Ajero simply needs to show up with his lawyer, listen to whatever charge that there is, maybe be granted bail, or taken to court granted bail, you know, if there is a case against him. I mean, if that was the case, you know, then we'll have a problem. The problem that they have is they, they feel like it's going to happen just like Nam Kano and previous cases where you go there and you won't come out for a couple of days or maybe weeks. All right. um, Elder David, good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning, ma. Good morning. morning. Go ahead. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, ma. Uh, with, with due respect to Ajero, the Nigerian Labour Congress chairman, if I were him, I would go and report to the police as a highly respected Nigerian Labour Congress. President, if I were him, I go and report. When Oshimoli was arrested during his time, when police when police come to call him, he go and report. He went to, if he able to like detain him, we know what happened. I expected him to go and report. They should not allow lawyers to deceive him because the case in issue concerns the nation's security. And as a landlord, or somebody was arrested there, he see the law. When an Arab robber is arrested in a house, the landlord must show cause. Why does he know the identity of that person? So that is my idea. That's why I don't state the tribal have been declared as, as, as the vice, as the deputy governor, and come on the 20th, yes, that 21st of September, by grace of God, God will give his own judgment. Let the man who is there today respect the law. Let him respect the law. That is your pastor kid should respect the law. Because right. in the front, in the back, in the right, in the left, everybody is an enemy to him, including the two people. May God bless Nigeria. May God bless all of you here. Thank all you right. very Father, much. Thank you. Our that is my conclusion. Thank Nigeria will continue to remain as one. We should give this government just a little child. It will be better for all of us. We did the next All right, thanks all right. a lot. Thank you very much, Father David. David. We um, turn against those people who are using them. Thank all right. you very much. Um, it's and very interesting. Still looking at the front page of the Nigerian Tribune. Um, the other stories there. Ododo appoints 1,128. You know, these are the, the current leaders that we have. It's the best time to be in Kogi. If you're a Kogi guy and you are not a part of this appointee, you ask yourself, what are you struggling and doing in, uh, outside your state? This is why you must be there to make it. But it should tell you how insensitive 
these are leaders are 1,128. We are not talking of, uh, <laughs> although by the time you look at some of the portfolios that will be given to those people, uh, it will shock you tomorrow. And these are taxpayers' money will come up to, the, the, to, to, to tell us that uh, the, the uh, funds being allocated to the state are not, rather than appointing them, why don't you set up organization where people can work and uh, make ends meet, be productive in your state. Uh, Kogi is blessed with industries. Uh, so all the money you are getting, you are just giving to a very few. Because these few eight that will be appointed now, we have access few? to running costs. 1,102 few. Uh, it's still few now. Just a handful. It's just wow. a handful. Not, there are not yeah, many. I get you. Uh, there are not many. You know, by the time we start, if a governor is having 1,008, imagine what will become of a uh, 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 president. Of a, of a nation. If such person is now made the president of the uh, Federal Republic of Nigeria, that means you just have 1,000. Just to give you a breakdown, we mm. have on the list 574 ward special assistants, mm. 290 local government special assistants. Mm. Um, then there are 165 senior special assistants, 36 special assistants, mm. and uh, yeah, I think those are the ones that we have for now. So just to say that there are 1,000 102 additional fresh aides. I believe that there were already aides. He hasn't been running his office. So kudos to Governor Ahmed Ododo of Kogi State for doing we can, we can reducing see. the unemployment, yeah, reducing the unemployment um, rate for young Kogi people. State. You know, he's making job available to the young Nigerian people. I start to tell and you Nigerians that, that is a wrong, that's a wrong way of doing it. It's not releasing any unemployment on the road. It's actually creating more poverty in that particular state if there is anything to go by. He, he, he getting those aid, is he trying to tell us that he's actually uh, uh, doing grassroots politics? These are people that actually work for him to become. That's not the way to go. Empower the people there and let those at the grassroots local government world feel the impact of governance. Not a very few that we just be there as aid. So as aids now, are you aware that if you are special assistant, there is special assistant to the special assistant? Of course. Uh, and there will be special assistant to the special assistant. I know what it just shows assistant. us. It, it shows us in a way how politics in Nigeria is being run. When individuals are not really campaigning for people, for their candidates because they believe in their in their manifesto. They believe in they believe what so they are going to get. When this person gets into office, what what um, SA role am I going to get? So at the end of the day, this is indicative of how politics in Nigeria That's the way it's been run. We are just seeing uh, the door coming with this figure. Which is Same is applicable, you know, with some other states where you see uh, 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 special assistance on domestic, special assistance on newspaper, special assistance. It's quite interesting, yeah. but I don't think this is the right... If you continue like this... Hmm. Anyway, um, just to keep in mind that Kogi State, you know, is uh, where former governor Yaya Bello, you know, mm. of course, you know, was a governor of... And, and the eagle still is still nowhere to be exactly. found. Exactly. Uh, the, well, the young man. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Go ahead. Good morning. Please go ahead. Uh, please, I want to talk about the presidential debt that they just unveiled. This uh, um, Nigeria is just is so a joke of a country. If it was in the same world, everybody in that government would have been arrested. Remember when this. A joke. This thing came up. People in that in this government denied it. Now they bought this thing without telling anybody who approved this thing, who assigned this thing, who did this, who did that. Imagine in US, you buy the just wake up one morning and bought. Um, they say they bought the presidential jet. Imagine what would have happened in US. Even in this our South Africa, our back here, our African country here. Yeah. So Nigeria is just a joke of the country. I don't know whether we have legislators. We don't, those guys, the 100, uh, 109 and plus 100, 300, they are just a joke of the people. What are we doing in the country? What are we running in the country? Or are we just sitting down and just watching people? Because what I can say is that the legislators, they are in the pockets of the, 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 the executives. That is not what it is. Who can say anything? So they are just running the government as they like as they can run their own family. Me, father can just go and buy a car without telling the wife. Or the telling the children. They will just right. So it's just it's just, just running as a family. That's just what I want to say. It's, it's a joke. It's, it's a pity that we are found ourselves in this part yeah. of the world. It's All right, Lenin. 
All right, thanks a lot. You know, and you know, he, he, he has legitimate reasons for feeling that way because you would expect that when there is a situation like this, there maybe would be a National Assembly um, uh, discussion. You know, somebody should be summoned maybe to answer these questions. Maybe yourself, when you like that, you'd be comfort of it, Mr. President. Is the comfort of every citizen. So Mr. President needs to enjoy <laughs> the best so that uh, he can concentrate and think right so that a citizen can be. We are sincerely He needs joking. to come and queue on Amadou Bello. This uh, I've so not I've not had fuel in the last three days yeah. because I cannot spend productive hours. An NPC filling station that I know of in this Lego. Let them come and point out. None is selling fuel. Well, you go to the bunch this morning reported an NPC uh, 9.3 trillion naira imports. Uh, they imported. Are they available on the street? I came here this morning with almost with my fuel, you know, showing red. Just to make sure that I get to the studio. You have to understand this mother daughter vessel issues, you know, is the, for the, them the today. Uh, we should, they should know the implication of this on businesses. You see, it's not only to fuel your vehicle. Are you aware that you still use the same fuel to power your generator when they're those things? Are not? So you invite your staff to office and there are no generators because there's no fuel and they're not going to work. Will you, at the end of the month, say, guys, we are unable to work and I won't pay salary? Or you owe them their salary. You, we, there are more to all these things that we're looking at. You are frustrating the domestic refinery of functioning by not providing that we are supposed to provide. And you want the country to grow. I don't understand. We keep announcing this import, import, import. Talking about 9.3 trillion. Not for 10 years. Old. We are talking of just import that you're bringing in. Imagine you taking that off and having it domestically, you know, processed. What value that would have given to Even you? Even though there are still allegations of the paying subsidy, but they say it's short for. No, I what I hear yeah, is, you see, we like using semantics to. It's, it's, it's no, no, subsidy is gone. Shortfall as cab. So there's a difference between shortfall and subsidy. You know, English, those of us that didn't go to school, we keep <laughs> asking ourselves, <laughs> subsidy is gone, but shortfall has been introduced. When you say that the landing cost is about 1,200, but you are selling at less than 600 naira. So that shortfall is not subsidy. So what's the definition of subsidy? Is it not? So very soon when we leave the issue of shortfall, we'll talk to augmenting cost. You know, you are augmenting for that particular thing. We yeah. should come off all this and let Nigeria know the true picture of what actually is happening for us to know where to go. Yeah, Businesses just, are bleeding. At some point, just merge both words and call it short CD. Uh, <laughs> good morning, Harry. <laughs> good morning. Good morning, welcome. Go ahead. Harry, please go ahead. Okay, um, good morning. Please, I want to talk about, um, I want to talk about um, the issue of um, the NLC and the president who was invited by the police. Now, I want to say this. I find it very absurd the NLC as a group threatening Nigerians with strike because the police invited their president. I find it very sickening this morning. Um, the police has the right to invite anybody, no matter who the person is. They have that right. Okay? Um, the NLC should go to the police and clear their name. They should stop threatening Nigeria. Yeah. Nobody is bigger than the country. I find it very sickening. But while doing that, the police should please stick to the rule of law and give him fair hearing. It's as simple as that. Yeah. And please, the second issue also about um, the presidential, the new presidential jet. We are in a country where we are complaining that there is no revenue. We have issue of revenue. You are telling the people to tighten their belt, and the president is buying is buying a new jet. The president is buying a new jet, a bigger one for that matter. You're complaining, America Air Force One is 34 years old, the one that you're, that you're dumping now is 19 years old, and you're buying a jet of 15 years old. So in the next four years, is the president going to sell, to buy another one? You know, you have to, as a leader, you have to lead, lead, lead by example. And how did the procurement process of this jet take place? We didn't hear anything, is it captured on the budget? The National Assembly, led by Senator Gosul Ababio, should, should stand up to Nigerians. Nigerians elected him there, and not the president. He's the yeah. president right, of the Senate, Nigeria Senate. All Thank right. you very much. You Thanks Thank you very much, Harry. I, I, I mean, I agree with points that he made. You know, we can't pick and choose who the police should invite, you know, or not invite. 
um, if there is a case against anybody in the NLC building, then they should be invited. You know, what, like I pointed out before, is what we're seeing is just a lack of faith in the criminal justice system. Because if we yeah, know we, that we they understand can show that. up. Yeah, we understand yeah. that. But irrespective of it, make yourself available. If you are detained, you, you, we can't compare Kano and NLC president. The, pres the, the presidency to understand that. Because the lieutenant will come out. They don't need their president to act. If they must do, the executive committee of NLC are there. If they consider that their leaders are actually detained unjustly. But what I'm saying is that he should make himself available. If he's not going to be available today as said by the lawyer, provide your uh, reasons to them. But show up and don't threaten. Nigerians are not ready for strike. Because we don't go for strike for non-functioning of refinery. We don't go to strike for uh, non-availability of foodstuff and the likes and high cost of living. All we are going out for is because they've, uh, they are holding the president that who is actually, uh, my personal view, spending some of the resources of the labor workers to travel here, around there. The last time that he was ill, did he have his medical treatment uh, in Nigeria? The answer is no. He yeah. was flown to uh, Switzerland. So we should, not, we should come out of this. Nigerians are not prepared for this issue of them going on strike because uh, they should go there, present their case. If he's, uh, if, if he's going to be detained, if there should be explanation to it. I'm sure the president knows the sensitivity of his position even to the economy, and they will not act on yeah. uh, something that is illegal. Very true. And, you know, I think on the, on the Nigerian Tribune this morning, you know, from the um, um, producers, uh, I think this should be from Zebe Jiro Productions, <laughs> the producers of the movie uh, Ponde has fainted in uh, hearing, the producers of the movie uh, Snake swallowed 36 million, the producers of the hit movie 70 million naira stolen by monkeys. Uh, we have, of course, yet another blockbuster production. <laughs> Five years after trial, AGF office has no record of XCG and Onogan's CCT case file. Also, the producers of the very fascinating movie where Gandhi's uh, court, court case, you know, of course, were stolen by, by end bad governance protesters. All right. Before you react to that, let's take this call from Adams from Tarabate. I love Zabi, Zabi Jiro. Good morning, Adams. Uh oh, oh well, mm. that's gone. Um, but anyway, um, Zebedro Productions once again. Um, how, uh, what Please. one pound road, Abba? You see, it's quite interesting the way and manner you read some of these headlines, and uh, you ask yourself, uh, what is the future? What is the hope of common man? Uh, when issues happen to a common man, the files are always intact. When it has to do with, with the high and mighty, it's either the building is set ablaze and taxpayers' money are used to rebuild it. Very convenient. Or you discover that those things are missing in action and nobody will be punished. That's the major problem we have. When issues happen, those movies that you just uh, made mention of, those that are surrounding the stories, that acted the script, yeah. they are still in power today. And that's what emboldened people. And that's what we keep saying. If there are no consequences for wrongdoing, all you'll be doing is that you'll be recruiting more people into that industry of acting that script because they have a precedent of somebody that has done that. What has happened to him? In fact, some of the people that acted in some of the movies we've mentioned were actually being elevated. Yeah. And yeah. what you get consider is that if you elevate such person, you are saying that you have done a good job. The rest of you behind, you can see a president and somebody who has acted well to continue until we are intentional, serious about issues like this to punish people that are around that area. Not just the fries that are under, but those that are at the top of the game to make sure that they actually receive the punishment. How can you be saying that the files that are available are no longer uh, can be traceable? Right. And that's why we are asking, make some of these things digitalized and save it in the cloud. I hope that they will right. not go no. to the cloud. Yeah. Just so thank you for joining us <laughs> to review the newspapers this morning. Thank you to all our callers who have called as well. We'll be back again with this same newspaper review tomorrow. But for now, we're going to break. And when we come back, it's which way Nigeria? Asking a very important question that we hope you can answer. Stay tuned. Welcome once again. There seems to be a memo 
on how to govern with complete disregard. That memo seems to be kept in one of the drawers in Asorok. Kept there, you know, maybe by previous administrations, but then more chapters were added to that memo by former President Buhari. That same memo seems to have been pulled out of one of these Asorok drawers and is now in use by the current president. It's the only explanation that I have to understand the meaning of a work stay. Because can anyone in Asorok help Nigerians understand better the actual meaning of a work stay? How does the president of a country just randomly get on his presidential jet and go to another country without any clear reason or explanation, without any stated diplomatic intentions or anything that sounds like it? Just travel out of his own country and go spend as many days as he chooses in a different country. Keep in mind that while Mr. President is on this mysterious work stay, 20 Nigerian medical students have been kidnapped and are still reportedly held in the custody of their capt uh, captors. While Mr. President is on this work stay all the way in France, Nigerians are fighting for their lives back at home with the highest levels of inflation. Petrol scarcity that is getting into its second week, the same levels of unemployment and poverty that his predecessor left. Complete uncertainty as to where the country is headed, amongst many other issues. While Mr. President got on his shiny new jet and is on a work stay in France. It's a seeming complete disregard for the urgency with which to ad address Nigeria's pressing issues. And again, I ask, what exactly is a work stay? Many Nigerians, of course, are asking the same question this morning. Is it common for presidents to choose to work remotely from anywhere in the world? I understand that we're in the age of hybrid work, but does that also apply to presidents? Do we have other presidents from other countries across the world routinely visiting Nigeria and working from Lagos or Abuja or Ibadan or Enugu anywhere? What exactly is a work stay while Nigerians are in captivity? While Asu is again threatening a nationwide strike, the Nigerian president can't just jet off on the presidential jet, which of course is funded by Nigeria's taxpayers' money without a reasonable explanation for the trip. And if he, he does, it shows a complete disregard for any sort of accountability to the Nigerian people, to Nigerian funds, Nigeria's money, and also high insensitivity to the times in Nigeria today. Keep in mind that the circumstances surrounding the purchase of this jet are still being discussed. But the jet, of course, has been used to fly Mr. President for this work stay in France. Mr. President landed in France yesterday, and there are no clips or pictures of him being received by the French government or the French, French president. So just like former President Buhari back then, he would just randomly jet away to the United Kingdom for medical trips or unexplained holidays, we once again seem to have the exact same format being used with our current president. So basically nothing has changed. And so to the president's handlers and those putting out statements on his social media pages, can we please remind Mr. President that there are currently 20 medical students in captivity. I know it's not necessarily his responsibility to, to, to jump into the forest or wherever they have been held and rescue them himself. I understand that. But can he be reminded that these are Nigerian citizens? Can he also be reminded that Ni Nigerians are being degraded at petrol queues every day trying to buy petrol in their vehicles? Inflation is still above 30%. Nigeria still has the highest number of poor people in the world. Asu is threatening strike if he hasn't heard. There's been no significant change in the realities of the people that he ran for elections to serve. And the common view across the country is that it is insensitive for Mr. President to be on a work stay again all the way in France while Nigerians are begging for some sign of hope. Good morning, Nigerians. Joe Ajairo has agreed to honor the invitation from the Nigeria Police Force on Wednesday, August 29th. Ajairo was summoned by the police over alleged criminal conspiracy, terrorism financing, treasonable felony, subversion, and cybercrime. Through his lawyers, Falano and Falano Chambers, Ajairo has requested details of the allegations leveled against him, citing Section 36 of the Nigerian Constitution. 
The police are expected to provide the requested information before the scheduled interview. Now recall that the Nigerian police force conducted a raid on the Nigerian Labour Congress office in Abuja on the 7th of August, acting on intelligence that is suspect described by the police as an international sub subversive element was operating from the NLC complex. Meanwhile, the Nigerian Labour Congress has directed its members to prepare for an indefinite strike if anything happens to its president, Joe Ajero. Joining us is the Nigerian Labour Congress National Head of Information, Benson Ukba. Good morning and uh, thanks for joining us. My pleasure to be here. All right. Um, I mean, we probably would just start with recent updates. Um, I, I, the news reports say that the NLC is asking for more time before Joe Ajero uh, honors this police investigation. So cl clarify with us, you know, will he be honoring the investigation? How much more time is he requesting for? And what's the mood around the NLC concerning this um, invitation? Yes, thank you very much. We, as a law-abiding citizen and as a law-abiding organization, Comrade President Joe Adero will be honoring this invitation. However, due to a combination <coughs> excuse me, of reasons, including the shortness of time, we got this invitation, I think, um, uh, in the evening of the 19th, and he was asked to report 10 o'clock the next day. And uh, so he did, through his attorneys, ask for time to um to adequately uh present himself before the police he also did ask for the details of these allegations in order to be able to respond uh, fully to the inquiry of the police of course the neck of the nigerian Law congress had an emergency meeting yesterday uh, during which certain decisions were taken. Uh, because uh, a criminal conspiracy, treasonable felony, uh, um, terrorism financing, and cyber crime are not your regular. Uh, charges of crimes. At this, at this point in time, let me explain that they have not uh, formally charged him, but, this, but these are telltale signs. And, and they are not your regular uh, offenses or crimes. Uh, these are maximum penalty carrying uh, 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 offenses or crimes. And uh, this tells you that the state as we pointed out earlier on, uh, has been planning this. And um, first, first through the first through the letter by the registrar of the trade unions asking uh, the Congress to explain its role or its relationship with the Labour Party. Government just woke up and decided to do this. <laughs> Um, citing section 15 of the Trade Unions Act. And uh, secondly, uh, government wanting to in interfere in the running of the trade unions via the issue of demanding that uh, you, you, union leaders should hold office for, I mean, for two years. Yeah. All oh, this all right. preceded, I mean, yeah. All right, Mr. Okwap, because of time, I, I want us to quickly answer as many of questions as possible. There, of course, you know, was, was the raid on the NLC um, um, uh, building in the Abuja on the 7th of August. Um, the police said it was targeted at one specific individual. Um, do you have any information as to who that individual is and his relationship maybe with the NLC or George Eru? I think only the police are in a position to answer that question. All right. And, and let me and, and let me quickly let me quickly answer this. If the police were interested in an individual on the second floor, what took them to the tenth floor? And what did they do on the tenth floor? Okay. And if they were interested in an individual, 
NRC uh, headquarters is not a residential building. Who were they expecting to get at 8.39 o'clock? If they were interested in, in, in such an individual, um, it should have been obvious for them to, I mean, to, I mean, to do their raid in the afternoon when that individual could be available. But in any case, if, the, if they had their intelligence well, if it was credible intelligence, right. what stopped them from, I mean, from sharing this information with an NLC leadership? Okay, we're going to also, that, what that, we're going that, to do that, is... that will jeopardize. No, I should respond to you. And, and, if, and, and, and if they felt that would jeopardize the operation, why, I mean, why wouldn't they do that at the H hour? That is the hour of, I mean, of, I mean, of, I mean of, of strike. So, so I do not know of any uh, terrorist or high crook that resides in NLC building or that, or, or that conducts business in NLC building. I mean, the police should tell us with facts and, and figures. All right. We hope that we can hear um, an explanation from the police. But we are out of time. If you can, please help us sum up your answer in a minute. What is the update regarding the strike? And uh, is there really going to be a strike there? Nigerians, do you think that the NLC would get the support of the Nigerians with this strike if Chuajayo is arrested? Well, I want to tell you this moment that there is high intensity mobilization going on in case. And I do think that uh, the Nigerians will positively respond to this issue because you remember, remember the poem that when they came for the Jews, I said I was not a Jew. When they came for the teachers, I said I was not a teacher. When they came for ABCD, by the time they came for me, there was no one to cry for me. Because this is intimidation, the shutting down of the democratic space, the gagging of Nigerians, the gagging of lawful dissent and all of that. And that is not going to be acceptable to us. Nobody is going to shut us out or shut us down in this country. Nigeria is a robust country full of energetic, prolific, active, and hardworking citizens. Nobody, no president can change that. And let those in power now remember their own history. Thank you. All right. Well, Benson, thank you very much for joining us this morning. We will see how things turn out in the next couple of days. Um, and of course, we'll continue to expand on the conversation concerning the NLC president and the Nigerian police. Uh, we hope that we also have a, a, um, a proper response from the police, uh, you know, clarifying some of these questions that have been raised. But that's all we have for you this morning. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back again tomorrow morning. I am Osao Gi And I am Olive Emodi. See you tomorrow. <laughs>